we are looking at the what now part of things. As correctly formatted, we now have the now part, right? There is no more compelling research agenda than the study of the human dimensions of global environmental change. This is definitely happening now, and we need to figure it out. And the what part of it is, is that we need to get people together. In the old class, we called it consummating relationships. We need to advance the state, current state of knowledge by getting the social sciences. I would even say we probably need some humanities in there multidisciplinary research with each other and with the biophysical sciences. And that's why I left out the anthropology part of this quote, because what I feel like my lesson from the last class is that the issues are enormously important. And the ideas and some of the research techniques are important. The name calling, the naming, the saying I'm this, saying I'm that, the street fights. We don't need that as much. So I don't care what you call it. I don't care if you call it anthropology, political ecology, historical ecology, as long as we're starting to converge on the important issues of our time. So that's my, my idea and why I think that each of these quotes are are important or I think reflect on what we need to do in this chapter. I did enjoy going back over some of the things that you did. And I, I don't know if you enjoyed it, but I pulled them up from time to time. Such as Anna on cultural determinism. Anna, you decided this was okay. Why? I don't I I agree I I don't think that we can leave out cultural determinism in today's world. Why can't we leave out cultural determinism in today's world because we have seen the massive human cultural influence on our time. We just look around and we see enormous cultural influence. Maybe in the very olden days, a thousand years ago, you might have been able to talk about people being shaped by their environment. But these days, most of the time, I don't even know there is an environment. I'm sitting in here in this windowless classroom. It could be raining, snowing. I don't know what's going on. So there's been a massive human cultural influence out there. And so in many ways, our world has been determined by this massive transformation. Now, going. Mickey, you also thought, though, that environmental determinism, which was once considered the opposite side of things, was still okay. Yeah. You still with me, even though I've tried to claim that there was massive human influence and basically I've become a cultural determinist right in front of your eyes? Yeah, and there's something else. Let's say I'm sitting here in this room and I don't know if it's day or night. I don't know if it's raining or snowing. Who knows what's going on? But in order to keep this room the way it is, what do I need to do? In order that I have no idea what's going on out there, what is required of me to keep me in this state of perpetual bliss? Huh? A computer screen? The internet? <laughs> it is true. If the internet goes off, I'm going outside and looking around. <laughs> it's like somebody pulled the cable on my television. It's like, what's going on? <laughs> Who took the internet away? That is kind of true. And in fact, I can probably sit through a lot of stuff as long as my screen is still working. I could probably sit through a snowstorm and even not feel the snow. But actually, though, <laughs> In order to keep my room the way it is, what needs to happen? Yeah, Tyler. 
yeah, I need those things to work. And what do I need? That generates energy and pollution and all those things. And then next thing you know, what happens to my little room where I don't feel the climate at all? Yeah, Liam. That's my environment. No, my environment is getting washed away by a sudden climactic change and the air conditioning is broken and the electricity has gone off and I have no internet and there's a lightning storm. I'm basically trying to tell you that. We can't endure environmental determinism because we've discovered that the environment is often like biting back at us, right? We do things and we think we're in control in the environment. And the next thing you know, I'm in a flood and I'm not happy about that. I don't have any internet. I don't have even have electricity, and that's bad. So I don't think we can discard cultural determinism or environmental determinism, but we do need to think about them and modify them. All right. Liam, I don't even know if you talked to us about Darwin. You did not, which is okay, because I think that Darwin, again, don't get me wrong. I love Darwin. I love evolution. We need to know about evolution. What I think Darwin most tells us is, is that we're not going to be able to just evolve our way out. It's in the sense that genetic change doesn't work that fast. And what happens if climate is changing pretty drastically? What happens to most species during climate change? <laughs> all right thank you yeah so we can use hand motions or we can speak and it doesn't matter we get the same thing they go extinct right and so the problem is is that evolution and this is proper darwinian evolution it doesn't just produce the changes that you need just because you need a change doesn't mean darwin and evolution is going to give it to you it has to come about through natural selection and natural selection might have Nothing to do with this. So we need to think our way out, not evolve out. It's not going to happen. Don't get me wrong, though. We need to understand evolution in order to be able to, you know, do vaccines and all that good stuff. Tyler, you were like, okay, with cultural ecology still, the Julian Stewart stuff? A little bit. Mm -hmm. So you like the subsistence part, the behavior part, and the Amish. <laughs> a good quote on the Amish. The Amish. The Amish obtain substantially lower crop yields than their neighbors. That sounds bad. But because of their simpler consumption standards and low-cost technology, they are able to live at a higher economic level than non-Amish neighbors who have comparably small tracts of land. You want to be Amish, right? Yeah, you're getting rich. Well, I mean, in the Amish way. Yeah, well, you know, you're living next to somebody. You don't need that truck. You don't need the Ford F-150. Just do your buggy. It does bring up the question, if you really are better off, if you just have that anyway. <laughs> Before we get down on the Amish, I think the idea here, and I, I, I do agree, that we need to examine or re-examine our subsistence needs that we need to survive and our consumption needs we need to consume. So we may not be able to get down to Amish levels, but you may want to think about doing things like that. Maybe the horse and buggy isn't the worst idea all the time. Uh, you know, maybe we need smaller vehicles, etc. So yeah ah, that was fun um Liz. 
Okay, so we're not probably, we can't all be Amish, and the Amish have the advantage of all belonging to one religious and cultural structure, which makes them, you know, which helps them to all cohere and do the right thing. And the problem in our society is we all want to do our own thing. We want to be individuals and make our own decisions. Want to have coffee when we want to have coffee? We want to have breakfast cereals? I forget what he had, eggs or breakfast cereal, and I don't want the Amish telling me what to do. I want to do my own thing, which brings us to the actor-based decision models that you were talking about. Uh, but you said we still needed these. True. Oh, no, you didn't want to do that. And besides, you never said that. You said that you wanted to add the ecosystem back in. That was me saying that these models basically ignore the ecosystem, which I think was a paraphrase of you, but I would never put your name in, you know, in parentheses there, because that was my joke. Anyway, <laughs> You said we should add the ecosystem back into these actor-based decisions, which I completely agree with. Um, and the issue is, is how do we get people to think about when they're deciding what kind of car to buy or what kind of uh, breakfast cereal to choose, how those decisions come into our, into our consciousness. And as you put it on page 83, now we might be venturing slowly into the next chapter. Um, Moran says that the tragedy of the commons is not inevitable. Now what Moran means by the tragedy of the commons is, uh, is an old, it comes to us from, uh, from the 1960s actually. And it's the idea that if you own something in common, Let's say there's a piece of land or the a lake that nobody owns. It's not privatized. The idea is that everybody who uses that land, let's say it's a graze, is a land where cows are grazing, that everybody who owns a cow is going to put one more cow in. And so my individual decision is I want to put in one more cow on that land. And because nobody owns the land and can't keep me from putting another cow in or fishing out another fish, then because of all these additive individual decisions, the commons gets wiped out. It's a tragedy of the commons. And so originally Hardin's solution was, well, if we just made all that land private, we could fence it off and keep people out and then you wouldn't be able to put a cow in there or you wouldn't be able to fish from my lake because I'd keep you from fishing it. And thus, he didn't want, he didn't like common land because, you know, it would eliminate this. Now, the anthropologists like, such as Emilio Moran and another person in, uh, that he mentions a lot here, uh, Eleanor o Ostrom, researched this and said, actually, as Moran says, it is not inevitable because most people don't just put in another cow or fish out another thing without talking to their neighbors about it. Most people actually who have common land have it because of a common agreement. And so they communicate with each other. There are certainly cases in which the commons goes to hell, but a lot of the time they have been maintained over centuries or even over millennium because people agree on standards of use. This brings us from the actor-based decisions to a crucial issue that we have, and it has to do with the now, right? The, the global implications of this. Because the tragedy of the commons used to apply to things like a, a, like I said, a commonly owned waterway or a commonly owned piece of land or a forest right, that nobody owned, but if everybody goes in and takes it out, and so, I mean, the tragedy of the commons is a huge issue on a global scale, right? Because nobody owns the ozone layer. Nobody owns the oxygen, right? Nobody owns the oceans, really. But the problem is, if we all make individual decisions and decide, it won't matter if I blow a little more carbon in the air, and it won't matter if I eat a few more tuna fish, then the whole thing, 
goes to hell, right? But you can't just privatize it all. You can't say, you guys can't eat tuna fish. Nobody eats tuna fish except me. You can't do that because it's the ocean. It's the ozone. It's, it's all around us. So how do we avoid the global tragedy of the commons? So what do we need to do to avoid that? Now, John, you told me that we should discard this section on ecosystem relationships. I feel like that by this conversation, this will prove me wrong. Uh, you can tell by the tone of my voice. Yes. <laughs> well, I disagree with it because part of the conversation at the time, it was talking about like birth and death rates. Yeah. If it was something related to what the title was, then I would, then I wouldn't. You wouldn't have even gone with it. Yeah, no, I, and I, I totally agree with you. And at the time, I remember I was getting really down on things. And I said, oh, so many initials, so many acronyms. What is us? And why did why is all this fertility there? And so you were right. You were like, I'm going to discard all this. And I would have agreed with you. But now that I think about it, no, John, we need it. We still do need to know about the fertility, like how many children people are having and when they die and well, demography. It was talking about like small population, like, well, because we have much more global, like measurements and systems within, even within the post happy what I mentioned, that's why. I'm, yeah, I'm, no, I'm, you're right. It's like, I'm not saying that we need to throw it out. I'm saying for like, pop, like small population wise, we can kind of, Move the vocabulary of like smaller, like, and then we can move on to yeah, that's bigger things, bigger and better. We don't need all the details, we don't need all those acronyms and the punctuation and the dash marks. We need to get to the big picture here, but we do need the big picture. And if he just would have called it fertility, mortality, demography, John would have chosen that section anyway, and we'd all be happy. But it's true. We do need this. This is an important tool, right? How many people are going to have a kid? Don't answer that. <laughs> but, you know, we need to know on a global scale how many and where the people are going to be. We may not need all the fights in the acronyms. I was about to discard the soils and the plant productivity. Cass, what do you think? Can we discard it? Oh, no. <laughs> Huh? You need soil. In fact, it's more and more important. It says you quoted in there. It's, there's more importance. We need the soil. We need the plants. We need to figure out what's going on. In fact, I think I said that at the very beginning of this class, that the, almost two weeks ago, I said we were going to talk about how soils and what kinds of plants fix carbon, nitrogen at high altitudes and all those things. So yes, it's become even more important than before. Ah, uh, thermoregulation. Ah, uh, yes. In the last class, I believe I may have made fun of Autumn for talking about thermoregulation because I said, who cares? I can crank the AC or I can crank the heat. Doesn't matter. Cultural adaptations. That's what I said. I don't care about what my body temperature is. I'll just crank the AC. However, as Autumn hopefully reminded me, why can't we just give AC to everybody? Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, I'm thinking about places like the South Asian subcontinent, right? I mean, you have, I don't know, over a billion people it's getting hotter. It's very difficult to thermoregulate your body. And one of the big problems we're having, even in Oneonta, I've noticed this over the summers, and not so much the daytime temperatures are heating up, the nighttime temperatures aren't cooling down enough. So I've had to keep buying more air conditioners because of the nighttime temperatures, because you have to be able to get your body temperature down overnight. 
But in a place where there is not air conditioning everywhere, for one thing, it is very difficult, even if we wanted to have everybody get one billion air conditioners, that would be very hard to do, right? So just logistically speaking, putting in one billion air conditioners is not the best. And if we did put one billion air conditioners in, it would be a total environmental disaster, which would only exacerbate the problems. And the next thing you know, we'd all probably be drowning underwater because the climate would have warmed even more. So now I rarely hawk products in this class or any class. In fact, I don't think I've ever hawked a product before, but I'm going to start. I'm going to ask you to hawk this product, not just to yourselves, because you probably can't, don't have this yet, but maybe to your parents or the people around you who have houses. If you want to cool yourself down or even to heat yourself up, what should you put into your house these days? Insulation is good, yes. Your house should be super well insulated as much as possible because that helps and then you don't have to generate energy to heat or cool it. However, even if you're well insulated, sometimes you need something else. Yeah. No, a fireplace. No, 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 no. A fireplace. That's like the worst thing you can do. First of all, fireplaces went out with Ben Franklin. They are all for show. And Ben Franklin realized, don't you know this? Most of the heat just goes up the chimney, like two thirds of it. That's why he came up with the Franklin stove, which is a wood stove that you put in the middle of your house, a wood burning stove. <laughs> there are some places where that's okay. And maybe you need a pellet stove, but for most of us, that is not a good idea. It's certainly not a fireplace. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if I can recommend even a wood-burning stove, but, you know, if you live in a place where that's okay, that is okay. Jacob? Yes! Ah, oh, thank goodness. Why you and the planet really need a heat pump? They look kind of like air conditioners, but actually they're better. They just move air around. And they have new ones these days that are called cold climate heat pumps. They can heat your house in the cold down to even below, even the pretty low temperatures. You might want to need to keep a backup plan, backup gas furnace or oil, but they can get you pretty good during the cold and they can cool you off in the summer. The installation costs, I will admit, are high, but We've passed some new legislation. There's some new credits for these, so you can take advantage of the tax credit or write-off. And once they're in, it's like pennies a day. It really is. The electricity that it takes to run these things is amazing. It's, it may be, if you own a house, it may be the single most important thing that you can do because the heating and cooling are huge. Insulation, too, but that would be the next thing. There are also heat pump water heaters to heat up your water heaters. And there's even heat pump clothes dryers. I don't know about these. I haven't gotten any of them yet. I'm trying. I'm working on it. There are tax credits, I think, for most of these things. So look into them. For those of us who live in the Northeast, really the house part is the most important. I would say go in this order if you had an order. Huh. I'm not hawking a particular product, but really for... For heating and cooling, we have to move in this direction. The ACs are getting better too. All right, what other tools do we have? The satellites, everybody loves the satellites. All those things floating around, we love them. <laughs> what about the balloon, exactly? We gotta shoot and start shooting things down. In fact, I think Biden has just been talking to the nation about what he's been shooting down up there. I missed that part. I was prepping for class. I have to figure out what's going on up there. But anyway, yeah, if Moran was writing this today, he'd be talking about the balloons, too, because they're remote sensors and get a nicer picture. I don't like them because we like to shoot them down. Um, anyway, 
what can we do with these, Autumn? What can we do with geographic information systems, also known as GIS? There's an acronym for you, and satellites or balloons. Yeah, so it's nice because, you know, send these balloons over a place, take a look at things down there. As long as nobody gets too excited and shoots down your balloon, you can make some recommendations to them about how to live their lives, which is what I'm sure the Chinese were about to do. They're just going to tell us what, what, what we should do over Montana. But, you know... Uh, so anyway, we can use these things to analyze things like land use and deforestation and those kinds of things. Anaya, is that all we need? Do we just send up a bunch of satellites and let it be? <laughs> we do need more than that. Who do we need? Yeah, we need some geologists, we need some sociologists, maybe even an anthropologist. We need people on the ground, too, to look up into the sky and wave and say, talk to people. We still need people to interpret what's going on on the ground. So as much as we get good information from what's happening up there and it can help us decide, as Moran says, you need to get this living human reality behind the land cover classes, which is, I guess, how they classify the land. So the anthropologists, sociologists, even the geologists are still important in this, uh, in this scenario. You do need to still go to the ground and figure out what's going on on the soils. You're not gonna get it all from the balloon. All right, what else can we use? Oh, Zeke, you love these things. The global models, how do those work? Yeah, this is uh, this is very important. If we if we were talking about global changes, uh, you know, when we talked a little bit about in the earlier chapters, we were having trouble just modeling little areas, and so th these models kind of sucked for a long time. To be honest, I mean, it was just very not great. But with the internet and with the data and with what you know simulations and multiple iterations and bigger and better computers we're getting pretty good at this and this is a, you know the the more data you can get uh the more it helps right victoria <laughs> what would you say do we can we just do this from a computer screen is that all we need Yeah, I think so. And so I think that there, I think you talked about how it is true in this chapter, they didn't go back to that ethno-ecological stuff that we were talking about, about going and talking to people about their knowledge and those kinds of things. But you still need that. That needs to be part of the system. In the same way we're talking about, it's hard to do things from outer space all the time. Sometimes you need to actually talk to people on the ground. So putting these two things together, I think, is hugely important so that we can um, adjust all these things. All right, let's see. We also talked, Jacob, you talked to us about political economy before. What do you think?
Yeah, I think that that's summed it up pretty nicely. I mean, obviously, you cannot ignore that people are of different social resource levels and have differential access to cash, and we don't want to we don't want to ignore that. I think the problem with the people who call themselves political economists sometimes they get a little belligerent, and uh, they tend to be a you know fighting with people, and so. Uh, the idea of getting better data on this, scaling up and down, maybe with those models, maybe with those satellites, seem to be an important part of this. So uh, something that we shouldn't ignore, but uh, we've got, we need to be uh, put it together with, with other, uh, with better data. Then there was political ecology. As I said, there is one one person who is unfortunately unable to be here who said that this sentence was prophetic. The one person who used my word prophetic is a big word to use, especially because it's, it's all Amish. Um, prophetic. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they know about prophets, right? Isn't that their thing? Huh? <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, the idea was that, you know, I think that this, I think that it is true, this idea that we have to, uh, we have to pay attention to outside influence, external influence and historical change. Now, when we we're talking about this, I said that Moran said that a beer sack has said that this political ecology still lacks a robust theory or a settled paradigm. And uh, nobody took me up on finding a beer sack, though I did. A beer sack and somebody else here, if you look very carefully at the side, were editors of a book called Reimagining Political Economy. Reimagining, or Political Ecology, I'm sorry. Reimagining a political ecology. So maybe they were starting to develop a robust theory and a settled paradigm. I do feel a little bit bad, you know, about, about being so. I talked about a Aletta of beers as if she were fighting somebody in the outside of a bar. And it turns out that she's a couple of years older than my mom. <laughs> As an emeritus anthropology professor and seems like a really nice person. I did watch a, a little YouTube lecture that she was giving just to figure out, and, you know, but she doesn't take shit from anybody. I'll say that. Somebody asked a question of her at the end and, you know, she just cut to the chase. She gave him this confused look and then said, well, well, anyway, her point was, which I think was an important point, is that we can't ignore the fact that um, that the differential political situation that different groups are in with regard to climate change. And what she was saying, she works in, uh, in, in, in the Pacific Islands, actually, and that, you know, that these people are owed a debt, an environmental debt, and we can't ignore that. We can't just act like everything is happy now because we have satellites and we're all working together. Uh, we, can't, we can't overlook that people are paying prices and that is a differential price for people to pay. So thank you, Dr. Beersack. Yes, Steve. This is not my field. It is my belief, though, <laughs> that some of them come down, but hopefully not many of them. Unfortunately, most of them are just floating up there, and there's a huge space trash problem that we have. 
it actually has become difficult to go out there and go beyond this. You kind of have to move around and avoid the trash to get beyond the trash. So in the same way, I think we were talking about how the, all the trash in the oceans, you know, how we're just offloading the trash. So some of the trash we just put in the ocean and some of the trash we just shot out into space. And so, yeah, there's a lot of human junk up there. Yeah, I mean, most of it is, but that little belt around the earth where it's all just sort of in the gravitational pole, but not quite, or in an orbit. Yeah, that's a yucky zone. I think, yeah, I think we're sending some archeologists up there to take care of it, but it'll probably take them a while. Yeah, that's probably why the aliens can't get through. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think. Where's the trash ring going to a flat earth? Where's the trash ring? Is it, is it... <laughs> I mentioned Eleanor Ostrom's work, and in this volume, she works together with our textbook author, Emilio Moran. He cites this fairly several times. Seeing the forest and the trees, which I love as a kind of summary of what we've been doing. That you can't just see the trees, you have to see the forest, you have to put these two things together, see both at once. And also how to make it so that individual trees can benefit and feel good about themselves, but it doesn't ruin the whole forest, you know, having good individual decisions where everybody can be happy. So both the forest and the trees can be happy together instead of one individual tree trying to be bigger and better than everybody else, ruining the forest for everybody. On pages 98 to 99, I know this sounds like about trees, but it talks about human decisions and how you make it so that people can negotiate, talk to each other, that they're making decisions that are individually beneficial, but are also okay for the group as well. It's not always easy. There's some problems there, but there seem to be possibilities. It can be done. So again, to summarize, big important issues, big things that we need to deal with, some important research that's gone into things. However, we probably can dispense with some of the names, name calling, street fights. I'll never make fun of 